Hello, hello. Welcome to What's Doing, where we uncover the stories behind the most influential personalities in media and entertainment. I am Abid, your host, and today we are joined by a true visionary in the Malaysian creative industry. Datuk Ahmad Izam Omar. Izam is the chief explorer of Comet, a company that's carving a unique path in the world of Southeast Asian content. He has a storied career, having helmed Disney Plus Southeast Asia as the executive director of content and creative and served as CEO of Media Prima Television Network and Prime Works Studios. He's a pioneer in multiple facets of media, from launching Tonton, Malaysia's first video streaming portal, to producing groundbreaking music with positive tone and leading innovative projects like Ijnali, the movie, and Pulang. Today, we will be talking about Datuk Gizam's achievement and his vision for the future of creative content. So without further ado, welcome Izam to our studio on What's Doing. And thank you so much for taking time out for us. Thank you very much for having me, Abid. Yeah. I would like to tell our viewers that this is Izam's first interview after he left Disney Plus Southeast Asia. Correct. And thank you so much for giving time uh, and for this interview. And uh, we really, really appreciate it. No, no problem. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So uh, let's jump right in. And uh, the burning question of the hour is, what is Comet production? How did it come <laughs> into inception? And uh, what are you doing with it? Yeah, okay. Well, after I've done a lot of uh, my stints, or I would say my tour of the big corporations, I remember how much fun it was to be an entrepreneur. Uh, that's how I started in the business. I, I had my record label. Uh, and then I, I you know I went on from there. Um, so I missed the joy of being an entrepreneur, being being your own boss. And I also marry that with the fact that I think I think I might have hit on. Uh, I I know some people know this, but I have hit on a strategy that maybe how you could invest into content um, profitably. Uh, because there are a lot of people there who think that oh, yeah, invest in films and invest in series. Sure, sometimes lose money, big, sometimes make money, but it's so volatile. But I think I thought there's a way that we could do it uh, in a structured way. Um, so I set out Comet, uh, starting out to invest first uh, and then to produce uh, films uh, mainly uh, in the Bahasa languages. Uh, and then beyond that, that's how I started. So I started my own, own setup, yeah. So that's a great setup because that's one space which is which is uh, you know underserved I would say mm. you know, coming from an industry perspective because where producers are always especially independent producers like us also uh, are always looking out for for institutions or for you know uh, investors where who they can come and and put in those uh, you know uh, production money so that we can fill in that uh, production slate. Uh, so that's a great initiative, and I think that in that space, not not many players are there, and I think uh, Comet is set to, you know, rule well, the industry <laughs> where, where finances are concerned. Set to go into space. <laughs> <laughs> it will, it yeah. will, it will for sure. Yeah. Uh, so, what trends do you see in Southeast Asia in the in the con uh, creative content space at this point of time? We see, um, we see a lot of local quality becoming better and better. And in some countries, it's uh, gone on super hyper speed, mainly because of the investment of the global, uh, whether it's, it's a content community or the global investment community into those territories. I would spe specifically like to highlight Indonesia as a space, as a country where a lot of investment has gone into their content industry. Therefore, um, everybody has benefited from that, from the directors to writers, producers. Have, they have, their levels have gone very high up. Um, and also because of that, um, they are also always looking for new creative talents to fill the demand of which then I think people across Southeast Asia can benefit working on these projects in Indonesia um, as, as a start in order to, to get exposed to that level of, of investment, that level of budget, that level of quality that, that, that they are exposed to right there. And then maybe after that, bring it back to the country where they come from and just hopefully spread the, the good information and knowledge and make good stuff. 
so you you're saying that uh, the premium malay dramas the the the, no, the adaptation and especially the ott space is where the trend is going or even with fta as well as oh, okay. ktv is also going oh, in th- in that sense local local is key local content is always key in order to be successful in southeast asia yeah you can you can do all the nice uh, universal uh, huge what you call um, uh, western content or korean content you will reach people as well but the one that reaches all levels of society would be always be the local content so i think anybody want to be successful in this region in a steady and long term and impactful way needs to have a local content strategy oh, that's that's always I means this is what the trend is going on actually uh, all the local stories are, are really given, yeah. getting all the love from the audience that's right whether That's it's right. Indonesian, whether it's Malaysian. Yeah. And I think uh, we have tons and tons of stories to tell. So I think uh, you're right. It means local stories needs to take that big, big stage. Reflecting on the launching of Tonton. Right. That's a long time ago. Man. <laughs> that was a long time ago. But I was then, five. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, at that point, of time, that was 2010, right? Yeah. yeah. At, yeah. at that point of time, you know, what were the key challenges and triumphs you know uh, because it was yeah. uh, one of the first uh, video streaming yeah. platform so and you, that was brought in okay. by I mean, done by you so what, right. what what was your experience what was your you know okay now i i believe that when you're in a position of of, of dominance or where you in your position of power or dominance it's your social responsibility to try and do something new and not always do the same thing but most people or businesses or leaders would fall into the trap if I'm already comfortable making a lot of money in my cash cow, I'm going to keep it as it is, right? Not knowing that cash cow will always be a, a leg guard, always, will always be something now, good for now, but three, four, five years later, maybe something will come up and usually something will come up and disrupt it, right? So what we saw uh, at that time, and I can speak of this because I was involved in the strategy then um, for, for Media Prima, um, was that there was a lot of people... No, you see, we didn't have Tonton, right? We didn't have anything. We just, people were, were watching some content on YouTube, like catch up. Or oh, that was also Hulu at the time. It's just started out, right? The iPad wasn't even launched at the time, right? So <laughs> so uh, what, what we did is we decided to, uh, in all our wisdom, we decided to put this drama called Nur Kase onto TV3's web, website and people can watch. And and you wouldn't believe it, Um it, the, the, the whole thing crashed. We had 64 million views. Wow. And that's not even 64 million people in the country. And <laughs> the most of the views were coming from uh, offices during lunch hour. And we're like, oh, this is, this is amazing. This is great. And, 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 and some of the uh, officers, we said, no, no wonder they are like that <laughs> because they're busy during lunch hour. <laughs> they're watching our shows. So they, let's, let's do this uh, nicely. So we went out and, and talked to some people, talked to Accenture, talked to a lot of uh, consultants and thought, like, let's, let's set up something like a Hulu thing for, for s- Malaysia. We didn't know that no other country in Asia has maybe a Japan, but no, they really tried this before. It was 2010, remember? Yeah. So we, 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 we launched it and we thought that, hey, it'd be interactive and, and okay, let's build it towards where it can be interactive and you can interact with this thing. But first of all, let's get this up. So we did, we did get it up. It was called Tonton. Right, uh, meaning watch, right? But uh, it's just a nice feel to it. Uh, and then we launched it. And, 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 and well, uh, right now, it's, of course, it's a different uh, kind of product. But at that time, it was meant for um, catch-up. It was meant to be free and advertising-based at that time. So how was that experience? Because that was being done at the, I mean, this was the first yeah. time it was being done in Malaysia. Right. What was your experience? What kind of you know struggles you faced, and what kind of you know oh, once right. it was launched, how was the love given by the audiences? Oh, yeah, for this naturally, product? internally and externally, people say, "Are you going to be uh, cannibalizing your own uh, channels?" And we we bravely say, "Of course not. It's a different market. Of course, I you know I had no idea, but you know sometimes being a leader, you just gotta look confident and say you know what you're doing." Even though half the time you have no idea what you're doing, <laughs> but if you if you look confident, like you know what you're doing, people used to gravitate towards the voice of confidence, right? So we said, yeah, no problem. It won't cannibalize, and and uh, Alhamdulillah, it did not cannibalize. 
because what what happened was that it got people who didn't have time to watch uh, that drama that they wanted to watch at 7 p.m. at at night whether they go, viewing yeah they, they, they want to because they're busy cooking or getting ready for prayers or something so they didn't have time to watch that right so they appreciated the fact that they can now watch it on catch up and did not disrupt the original watching so the guys internally who said oh no our, our ratings going to go down no the ratings actually went up because what happened was that people said hey do you know this drama i didn't watch and they were talking about it in the offices i watched it on on this thing called tonton and then you know, i got to watch it tonight so they are watching back on tv3 so the whole thing grew and our ratings grew our advertisers grew so i was like oh, okay so this worked so there's no such thing as commercialization it kind of helps each other now we all know this hindsight right everybody knows if it's good on on theater we go on online that's the mean that if it's good on theater we kill on no it, it's kind of together if it's bad it's bad together right yeah it's it, it all for boils down to the content and, mm. and if it's a good content we right. work both ways right you have been one of the leaders of of media prima and you have seen media prima grow right and during your time and right now uh what the vision you had for media prima are you satisfied of all the work which you've done there as it's been continued and and uh, and it still My. holds water till date Yeah I I I would think so I, I of course obviously I can't comment on the strategies of Media Prima now because I'm I'm no longer there but they seem to be doing well but what I did um last last time that we we had this management team going on we had uh, I was in charge of the TV networks so I was in charge of Prime Works at that time uh I had my chance at radio I did some digital work and all that but what's good about it is is that um after going through all that we knew that it was I come back to this cash cow. It was a cash cow at TV3. You got to make it like a cash cow. You can't pretend that that you're going to try something innovative on that on TV3 because your cost base is too high. If your cost base is high, you try something innovative, you lose the mass market, then you lose your entire ratings and your reason for existence, right? So that's why they had things like 8 TV and then TV9 and TV7 and and, and Tonto and all that to in order to try new things. Uh, and with that we use those things like 8 TV I really went crazy and did all sorts of, of of new things got new sponsors coming in and all, all that kind of stuff and it it did very well um and it's still doing very well 8 TV which shows that if you stick to what you know best and you stick to your vision and you sell that vision and you get the crowd you stick to it is doing well I mean I just went to the 8 TV 20th anniversary party that day um uh, and Lo and behold, they're still profitable. They're still strong. They still have the great shows and all that. So I was, I was very, very happy that what we set out to do 20 years ago is still going on strong right now. Yeah, but that's that's your vision. That was the vision at that point of time, yeah. which has been followed and which is still profitable. Yeah. So kudos to you. Well, oh, yeah, thanks. But the, the team currently doing it. It's uh, kudos to them, right? You know, uh, they they followed through, and I think the, the base which was made for them, I think, was strong enough to to carry it on. So now I want to move to. Pulang. Oh, okay. Pulang was your personal story, and you know, it's family. Your family story. How did you balance the personal narrative uh, with cinematic elements? Ah, oh, it's just well, very straightforward. Number one, I made sure I did not write the script myself, because you need to have another point of view. So we had the wonderful Mira Mustafa working on it as well. I wrote the original draft, but then I realized I was too close to it. Now, I'm too pragmatic to know. that you can't let emotions guide your business decisions right all i knew is there was a story in there somewhere i fished it out i wasn't satisfied to it because i'm i'm scared that i was too close to the forest to see the trees so i left it in passive mira she changed it beautifully and made it into a love story because mine was too factual uh, there was a story that I, it was still too too much info in there so she she changed it and she made it work right and so credit credit to her so i put her first in the in the what I call it uh, in the writer write <laughs> credit she's first i'm second you know even though i wrote a lot of it but she 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 really did amazing stuff to it and then we we did it the right way it went to pitching it went to and when the pitch panel uh looked at it i abstained from anything i didn't say why because i don't want nobody to know what's going on and so it went through and it went through all the pro- proper approval processes and all that and and the reason why we attempted it was because um we had uh it was budgeted low enough for us to take a crack at it it wasn't like one of those big crazy production budgets right that if you lose money you lose big now this one if you lose money is not so so big right 
with that, might as well take that risk and do it now. And so, so we did. And I think we managed to do, do well. We managed to sell to Netflix at that time and did got some good stuff from it. So yeah, so I, I, it was a very, very good experiment and a, and a very good story for, for us. Yeah. Yeah, so but that basically creates a lot of a different kind of, you know, challenges when you're close to the story, when you, uh, you know, when you know too much about the mm. story. So those challenges, how did you meet with those challenges? How did you overcome those challenges? Okay, yeah, you got to step back and, and say that you can't be guided by what you believe anymore. Meaning that uh, I, I already said to why I said we had the synopsis treatment and we had a script. Now I got to step back. And let other people take over and change it, because they would have no, they would know what scenes to put in, what scenes to cut out, what to change to the story to make it even better, right? As long as it's the point where everybody agrees that it's a story to be made, right? So you gotta step back. If you are involved in the process too much, uh, then then, in especially if you are the boss, right? Then nobody says anything. So you gotta step back and, and say, no, you guys take over, and that's what I did. You guys take. I'm not. I'm not gonna be involved in it. Even in, in the end, if they shoot down the script, they shoot down the script. You can't go like, no, you can't get emotional. In the end, it's, it wasn't my company, right? Yep. Yeah, so I can't be making the decisions. If it was my company, yeah, I can make one. <laughs> but it's somebody else's company. And I remember we always hold any company that we work for, we all we are holding it, we are representing the shareholder. Whatever we're doing needs to be to increase the value of the shareholder. Now, it does sound like there's some capitalist thing, right? However, if you put you put your vision in such a way that you know where you're going to progress the company, even if nobody understands it, as long as on the way you're heading there, you're still giving shareholder value. And when you reach the journey, you tell the shareholders, look, we did something new, right? You never noticed it because I didn't tell you, but we reached there. That's the beauty of, of it. But you always need to progress, progress the company. So in that sense, I held back and made sure that everybody worked on the script uh, and worked on the production and, you know, and that's that, that's the right way to do because yeah. again, you said that it has to be financially viable. Yeah, yeah. If not, not don't 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 do it. Yeah, it's crazy. Switching gears here, um, can you share insights into the evolution of Malaysian content in the digital era? Wow. And how do you balance innovation with commercial viability in your projects? I would like to go way back <laughs> into my record label days, where I found a strategy introduced to me by my sales manager at that time. Uh, when you want to release a new album with new music, for example, that nobody understands, but you know it's going to be, be, be big. But nobody else understands because there's no precedent for it. You can release it as it is and pray, right? <laughs> uh, which we did because I was 24. <clears throat> 24, I was foolhardy, I was silly, I didn't know what was going to happen. So we released a, a band called OAG and it went triple platinum. Like that was fluke. But it wasn't actually because we were out in the streets listening to people jumping up and down at, 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 at gigs knowing that this is the next big thing. But using OAG as a successful uh, test bit, the next thing we wanted to release was Innuendo. Right? Now, Innuendo was also tough because it's R&B and it's really hardcore R&B. It's not the pop R&B, it's hardcore soul R&B. It sounds like Jodeci meets Boys to Men, right? Yeah. Now, that's crazy. So what we did was when we released Innuendo, we released OAG at near the same time, knowing that OAG second album would be success. So we released a big successful thing at the same time as an it's experimental thing. Once you do that, if that experimental thing fails, nobody can see it. Because, because you know, you the other one thing. has already become so, so I've been successful. doing it all my life from 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 radio, from 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 TV, radio, everything, just to make sure that we release something experimental, we got something else near it. So that people can see that okay, they they're not going backwards, you know. But in most cases, I've been very very lucky that all the stuff that we release as a new thing has gone on to become the big thing. And then you need a new thing then uh, to to keep on progressing. Yeah. yeah. So balance it by commercially by making sure that you always have something, in a way, safe around you and fall back upon. Yeah, fall back on. Yeah. Huh? That's great. Now we're moving to the OTD uh, right. story. So selecting the best content from Media Prima, or the, the library Media Prima had for Disney Plus, right, was the perfect strategy to capture the Malay audience for Disney Plus. Uh, did that strategy work uh, to divert the Malay mainstream audience to Disney Plus? I I would talk about it generally. Uh, as we started, local content is key, right? Local content is most important. 
Um, so having having stuff from the FTAs um, onto your OTTs may sound like uh, why are you doing that because OTT is premium, right? But not necessarily so uh, because any OTT would always benefit from having uh, local content on it, you know. Um, and having local content means you are reaching the mass. Now the mass is bigger than any of us know. I would say me and you are not the mass, right? We 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 go we wake up right in an air conditioned car, come to a conditioned hall, come to the conditioned. I mean, just go back, sleep in our little, you know, beautiful gilded tower, <laughs> whatever, right? But ninety nine percent of people out there are a mess. I used to say it's eighty percent. Then I went up to ninety. Now I think it's ninety nine, mainly because if you have a local content, no matter what the quality is, right? Put it on an OTT, you are, you will see the numbers just go crazy. Because the mess is so big. And the reason why the mess is, keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and the urban or the English speaking side getting smaller and smaller and smaller, mainly the mess reproduces more. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's more population. You know, so, uh, and they're going to keep increasing. So we have to understand that going in. Uh, and that's why local content is key if you want to have a long lasting uh, I don't know, presence uh, in the market. But if your target is just to a niche crowd, then obviously, yeah, okay. You can work with a niche, uh, niche offering. So, what has been your most fulfilling uh, project at Disney Plus? Oh, uh, there are a lot of fulfilling ones because we got to work on a lot of great stuff. But I think uh, working with the best directors and writers and producers over overall in Southeast Asia has been the most fulfilling bit. You know, all the all the talents that you can see, all the script writing levels that you can see producing um, expertise that you can see from various different countries. Um, you know, it just makes you see uh, what, what sort of amazing talent there are out there, right? And and one of the most um, uh, amazing projects that we got to work on, I, I think there's two. Um, both are from Indonesia. Um, one is from this, this slasher horror director called Kimo Stambul. People know him as part of the Moe Brothers, right? So he did something called Telo Dara for us. It's about black magic. And and you think, it's, oh, it's just black magic, right? The way he did it, it's stylized black magic. It's so amazing. Uh, it, went, it, it premiered in Busan. So it did really, really well. Uh, the other one is actually something more mass market, unbelievably, for me, right? It's called Wedding Agreement, the series. It's halal romance, man. <laughs> And you thought, oh, yeah, something you see on TV every day, right? Oh no, the way they did it, uh, it's so it's so catchy, it's so nice, uh, and and it's it's caught the attention of uh, a lot of communities around the world, who really want to see what is what is modern Islamic romance like. And well, that's you know, a huge market. You know? It is, huge it market. is huge, but nobody pays attention to it. But when you mention halal romance, suddenly everybody ears perk up and go like, hey, what's it? Can I know more? If you say it's a Southeast Asian drama, I say, oh, okay, halal romance? Oh, they're in, they're in man. <laughs> you have a, a billion eyes looking at it. Yeah, yeah. And the story is good. So, yeah. yeah. So, going to the originals which Disney yeah. Plus made, like the Special Force Anarchy. Right, right. Know. Creating that series, did it expand your audience base on, on Disney Plus? Right. The, subscription, the subscriber base? Yeah. <laughs> Again, I can't comment on those things, but uh, but yeah, as I said, uh, having local content always works. Always, always works. Uh, whether in, in, in Malaysia, we had Asian Ali season three, Special Force Anarchy. In Indonesia, we had a lot of uh, a lot of series. You know, all of it kind of did, did give uh, that sort of uh, penetr- it, it increased uh, awareness and penetration into the subscribers. Yeah. So, what was your key learning while your tenure at, at Disney Plus? Oh. Uh, that there's always a better script writer just around the corner. <laughs> you think you're true, actually. Best? That's true. Suddenly, out of the blue, some girl from Surabaya who just started writing comes up with this beautiful script. Like, oh my goodness, where did you come from? <laughs> right? So, you cannot, cannot always think that you will know everything. There's always someone better out there, and you just have to guide. If they, they are young, even better, just. Just give them the parameters of where to go and see them fly. Yeah. And then if they don't know how to partner up with the right people and you got the contacts, you partner them and see them both fly. I right? need to talk to you about that then. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 really good. So means 
we have seen you means in, in in different you know different positions right. in the industry and uh, and you've done such amazing stuff for oh, the industry thanks, yeah. uh so what is the legacy you want to leave for for the malaysian uh, you know content and creative uh, industry i i i always wanted to make stuff that makes the whole nation or the whole population move but it's not mass for mass it's always urban for mass uh when i was in the music industry people thought i made an urban for urban but no i was always doing urban for mass because urban for urban 50 people in damansara high will buy your album right? yep. and then what right you might as well let them have their own thing right i rather make the 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 amazing urban album that the mass market will love right so i applied that across everything that i've done so the legacy i think if anything is see that oh yeah he always just always give us new stuff and make us like experience new things you know and and oh that's fun lah that's and then when society you know taste right taste do not regress taste always move forward right yeah once you try something new you don't want to go back uh w- w- once you have a louis vuitton handbag right yeah. you don't want to go back you want this one that that handbag that kind of thing so once you try something new once you feel this this new song once you try this new drama uh, you know production then taste will always move forward therefore then society altruistically will always move forward and i think i would like to think that i have a hand in helping the progression of our taste especially the mass society and now that you have you have you're funding a lot of projects i think you're going to take it to the right yeah yeah so i'm looking for stuff <laughs> that that's that's mass appeal but new yeah right not mass appeal but mass then then i'm like and like everybody else out there so mass appeal but Hey, let's give them something new. Let's try this. Let's try that kind of story. Let's kind, of, you know. That'll be great. That'll be great. So right now, you know, we are at the crux of you know very different kind of cinema being made. Right. Okay. Uh, but still doing well, uh, you know, domest in the domestic market. How do you think it can, you know, make that uh, crossover to international recognition? I think it's easier now thanks to the OTTs. Actually, to be fair. and thanks to the success of uh some of this this stuff from all around the world that's making success across the world I mean Korea Korea has led the way right uh but now you see Indonesia leading the way I mean uh they got some successes across OTT that the world has seen so people are getting more used to seeing people of a different race a different color being the heroes of that story you know and and that is good because that means that the stories can now cannot travel So I I think it's 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 a good time right now and we just got to keep pushing at it and keep coming up with the with, with good stuff and the stories are universal the key I'm learning right now is that and I already knows this I think but you got to get the story as local as you can be as deep as you can be in the local culture but the story itself and the learnings and the and the, what what the hero goes through is something universally can be understood Right, so I think I think that's key, local but universal. Yeah, uh, and so so that's why when when I get a lot of pictures where you see, especially from these young writers, who want to write like Mike Flanagan, you know, or wants to write like Quentin Tarantino. So their stories are very urban, but I I always say that's that's fine. But you already have a Mike Flanagan, you already have a Quentin Tarantino. Be yourself, right? Write what you know, but can you apply what they do best into your writing? So it's very local. Mike Flanagan cannot be you if you're from Trengganu and writing about something very Trengganu Trengganuish, mm. but make that some something that the whole world would like to see because it ain't seen something like that before, right? But the story structure is very important. So that is, I think that is happening in in a lot of uh, industries around the yeah. world. <clears throat> yeah. Take for example in India, mm. the hyper local stories, like really uh, you know stories set in villages and stuff. are uh, making it to the top 10 uh, list yes, uh, yeah. in IMDb and the most watched series right. and i think that that formula works because the stories you will get in in a in a hyper local right. situation you won't get in an urban uh, you know no, urban I'm, i'm watching indian matchmaking right now <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> but that's made in new york <laughs> yeah i know but still it's something very local something very different right uh, yeah you're right hyper local uh, works you know um But then, you know, when you grow up, that's that's how it is, right? When you're a teenager, you just want to emulate your heroes, uh, and and sometimes your your heroes are usually from the west, right? Yeah. So you need to cross that copying and aping, 
until you find your own voice and suddenly you realize that you got to be uh, uh, as local as you can be. I just, I just, I don't know why I keep coming back to the my record label experience. Cause all my artists, when I first started out, right, all of them wanted to be, you know, two pop or boys, two men, right, or, or, or Foo Fighters. That's their first few albums. The next albums are all done in their local language. And it went, you know, it went gangbusters, right? So it shows that, that they had to go through that uh, imitation first and then become more, even more original. So what's next for, for Comet? What, what is the slate looking like? What, can you talk about that? Because yeah, uh, I yeah. think everybody is, is waiting for, for Izam's next move. Uh, right. <laughs> so Comet has been investing, uh, actively investing uh, in some really great movies around the region. Uh, some will be released this year, um, and Comet got got in touch with the investment community uh, to help in its in its uh, progress of doing this. Uh, we believe in the idea of a slate strategy, so that we always uh, you know uh, diversify our portfolio. I sound like a fund manager, man. <laughs> but you can't invest in one. You know, I, for all those guys who want to invest in movies out there, I will tell you, please do not just invest in one. Because there's such a thing called a hit rate. Yeah. Even Steven Spielberg has a hit rate. Even Pixar now has a hit, hit rate, rate, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you nobody does. If you do one and and it and it usually fails, then you will blame the film community when it's actually your fault. You gotta invest at least two or three. The best is five, right? Yeah. If the hit rate is about thirty percent, you should invest in about five. And then that means you don't have to invest 100% in everything. You just go minority in everything, right? So your risk rates are down. Yeah, basically. yeah, yeah. So putting that awareness across the investment committee and, 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 and alhamdulillah, they actually like it. And I've got some investors uh, along with me for the ride. As well as not just investing in other people's movies, but also in my own productions coming up soon. Oh, so that'd that, be that's, great. Uh, that's happening uh, very fast right now. Uh, I'm losing more hair every day. Yeah. <laughs> So, okay, yeah. uh, the last question, which I always ask you, what were the five good uh, content pieces you watched last year? You asked, I, I, I knew you were going to ask me this, so I prepared. <laughs> I am prepared. Oh, really? Because, because I had 20. <laughs> so I, I had I to know, right? I didn't bring it down like, okay, I got to bring it down. Okay, number one, number one, and not because, not because I came from Disney, number one is The Bear. Oh, I loved it. Ah, the I love How do you write like that? I feel like crying whenever I see that. Right? The anxiety level which that show creates oh. is just insane. Yeah, there, there was one episode in season one, season one where it was just one camera yeah, moving shot. Around. Oh, I just even the last season's you know uh, finale. Yeah, was I? I haven't. I'm in middle oh, yeah. of season two. So yeah. So did you watch the the, the Christmas dinner? Episode? Not yet. I know that was it. Oh. I know. I know they said that was it. So I'm I, reaching there. I I'm had to the... pause and I had to go and drink water and come back. Oh and, my and god! I it was that, yeah. that intense. So the best one, uh, number two is uh, beef. Oh, beef was good. Yeah. Beef was good because uh, something so basic became such craziness, right? Yeah. So I like that. Uh, I thought uh, Wrexham. Welcome to Wrexham. For Ryan Reynolds and oh, yeah. um, McKelnany, whatever his name was. Um, the fact that, I mean, I like those feel good things where you actually do a good to a community and you bring up Wrexham. So, like and, an underdog story, which. Yeah. And now, of course, obviously, they are the envy of all the clubs in that level. But, I mean, kudos to them. They, they, they are now second in, in League Two. So they should hopefully be promoted and they go into League One and then championship and then you never know EPL in three years. You never know, right? So it could work, you know. So yeah, um, that's a, I, I'm definitely going to watch that one. That's number three. And four, because I love musicals, is actually Wonka. Oh, <laughs> because yeah. I like the singing and dancing. Oh, lovely. The songs are good. The songs, the story is standard, but the songs are very catchy. Because so this I time, Timothy Shamale has, has sung the song. I, I went in there thinking, Timothy Shamale, Really? Then I came out feeling, wow, okay. I mean, it's no whiplash, but... It's a feel-good. It's a feel-good thing, yeah. Uh, and the last, uh, actually, go back to Telo Dara. <laughs> what I did. What? That's, you gotta watch it. Yeah, yeah of course, you gotta watch of course, it. Of course. You, got, you gotta watch it and you'll be like second-guessing yourself. I'll be so angry at the end and the double double reveal at the back. Oh, it's just... Quimo and gang did really, really well on that. Yeah, so Great, I'm gonna watch that one yeah. also. 
Thank you so much, Jidam, for no coming problem. over the show, and I really, really hope that we are going to work together in the future. Nice. And also, our industry folks who have a great story, come and tell Jidam your next story and see nice. how we can help you out. And uh, yeah, we we wish you all the best, and we wish uh, Comet the best uh, in the coming future. And I, thank you for doing this initiative because this is really great and something the industry really, really needs. Thank you. Right. Thank, thank you very much. I wish you success. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Jidam. All right. Izam's story is a powerful reminder of the endless possibilities in the media and entertainment world. His dedication to innovation, nurturing talent and pushing the boundaries of content creation sets a benchmark for aspiring creatives. I am Abid and this has been What's Doing. Till we meet again in the next episode, keep stewing. Mm-hmm.